It was in early 1941 that recruiting began in army camps in Australia for special units called independent companies. They were to be no more than 300 all ranks with a higher proportion of uh, officers than usual. The, uh, their roles and future roles were kept vague, I think, mainly for security purposes. This great letter came out to say if you wanted some exciting soldiering, if you were an independent-minded fellow, if you, I can remember, if you could kill a kangaroo or skin a sheep, um, uh, all sorts of things, and, uh, and that was my cup of tea. I'd you know, done that since I was eight. And uh, I said, well, that all seems pretty easy. That'll, that'll do me, but I, I didn't know what the rest of it was all about. They said it was going to be very dangerous. You'd at least see some fun or some action. In the beginning, we thought we were going to Europe because the, Japan was not in the war. The training was tough, uh, with an emphasis on uh, self-discipline and in preparation for raids on installations behind enemy lines. At the top secret number seven infantry training centre, there is no room for second best. The British instructors, commandos as they are called, push the volunteers to their limits. They want only the best, and we are privileged indeed that they are prepared to share this brief glimpse of their training methods for our camera. today we're going to defend this position against Captain Calvert's crew. We will position ourselves. I'm afraid you chaps are all dead or captured. But sir, the exercises are supposed to start for another hour. Well, it's a little difficult explaining that to the enemy when you're dead, don't you think, Captain Baldwin? Nothing like a bit of noise, eh, Freddy? Oh, well, damn you, Mike, with your damn explosives. Bit of plastic, that one. Nice. Right the right. whole approach of the uh, British officers that brought the training to Australia was innovative. They brought new weapons, new equipment, and uh, demolition devices of all sorts. Captain Freddie Spencer Chapman was uh, an expert in all aspects of field craft, and uh, Captain Michael Calvert was a specialist in uh, preparation for raids and uh, in, for demolitions. I remember greeting them by doing a front roll through the window with my hat on and saying any complaints <laughs> when they were at lunch. Uh, this rather surprised them for uh, a British Army officer. They expected British Army officers to be, have a monocle and a moustache and to smoke a pipe and to have a swagger cane to hit their boots with. We felt a bit apprehensive, naturally, as pommies coming out to teach tough Australians. And so we felt we had to sort of keep on top, both physically and in expertise. There wasn't a hell of a lot of training. It was about six weeks. Whereas nowadays, these regular armies say it takes two years to make a soldier. With the outbreak of the war in Europe, Australia needs no prodding to rally to Britain in her hour of need. Already, the cream of Australian young men, the second Australian Imperial Force, is fighting grimly alongside their empire allies in northern Africa against the Nazi and fascist Italian aggressors. Benghazi, Tobruk and El Alamein become arenas for heroism and dogged Australian courage. At home, however, there are those who worry that too many of our forces are on the other side of the world, leaving our shores easy prey to a would-be aggressor closer to home. Wary of Japan's announcement that it would remain not neutral but independent, we are quietly glad that impregnable Singapore is deterrent to them. The day after the Japanese announced their uh, entry into World War II by attacking per, uh, Pearl Harbor, we were ordered to Darwin and there we joined the uh, 2nd 40th Battalion and uh, embarked with them to go to uh, Koh Phang in Dutch Timor. And a few days after we were in Koh Phang, we were ordered to join a Dutch force that was going to occupy Portuguese Timor. Timor, just 500 miles from Australia, one of the islands being prepared for the unlikely event of Singapore falling to the Japanese. Dealing with neutral Portuguese Timor requires diplomatic intervention. 
You know, Colonel, <clears throat> the Portuguese governor isn't going to roll out the red carpet to a garrison of Dutch and Australian soldiers. They're neutral. I've got my orders. Besides Mr. Rothschild, the diplomat. You talk to him. <sighs> what if he says no? Can't help about that. We're going in anyway. The Australian consul in Portuguese Timor, David Ross, was given the difficult task of explaining to the governor that in spite of uh, Portuguese neutrality, that the Allies were going to occupy his territory, the territory that the Portuguese had occupied for over 400 years. As the governor of Portuguese Timor, I must protest in the strongest possible terms against this breach of Portuguese neutrality. We are not at war with Japan. We have not asked for protection. I have been denied time to contact Excuse the Excuse me, sir. What is it? I've convinced the Colonel that it might be a good idea for the troops to land outside Dili itself. Would that help? Any landing will be resisted. Sir, any resistance will probably mean unnecessary bloodshed. We are absolutely determined to prevent the Japanese from using your airfield. Does that mean that I have no say in the matter? I'm afraid not. A reação de, de geral dos chegados australianos a Dil, eu não estava lá, mas uh, uh, uns umas pessoas acharam bem e outras não. We didn't go into the town, of course. We landed on a on a little beach near a coconut plantation to get out of the way because they weren't sure whether the Portuguese would put up any resistance at all. Eu uh, acho que não, que foi correta a ida dos australianos. Primeiro porque uh, era preciso de facto defender a Austrália. E segundo, porque nós próprios portugueses não tínhamos defesa nenhuma, visto que tínhamos umas armas antiquíssimas, que já quase não disparavam, tínhamos uma força mínima e, 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 e esperava-se que depois de, 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 de os japoneses entrar uh, na guerra, no Pacífico, depois, uh, certamente que eles iam atacar Timor. My impressions of Portuguese Timor was, to say the least, awesome, uh, having regard to the terrain, especially being West Australians, we had no idea of the height of the mountains. No such thing as a mountain range, they just a mad throw up, you know, that went in every direction. The first of the natives we saw were, uh, of course, we'd been warned against them as alleged hunter, headhunters and everything, but they, they looked too small to me to take off my head or anybody else's head. Initially, you can get by with sign language, and then we gradually started to pick up the, the basic words, uh, and we realised that we had to be able to speak their uh, language. They'd been told that um, we were murderous villains and lock your women up by, by the Portuguese. Uh, and when the first night had gone and nobody had been raped or anything like that, uh, they very, very quickly got it into their head. That, uh, and when they found that our blokes all, along, all over the place were sitting down with them, trying to learn their language. One of the funny aspects was that the, uh, they picked up the swear words and the nicknames of people. And they'd come out with you know some officer's nickname and he probably hadn't heard it himself. <laughs> <laughs> the Portuguese were a colonial power and they regard them much as, uh, well, as the British regarded Negroes and the Southerners regarded slaves and so on. I think just as people to be held in their place and used, well, our view was different altogether. It was a, a fraternal arrangement as much as anything, and I think that's probably what the, made them uh, 
like our ways, if we joke and with them and talk with them on even terms. But on the other hand, we were much bigger and we were armed, so there was never any doubt as to who was boss, and I suppose we had probably an air of conscious superiority that way, but uh, uh, we wouldn't in our conversation and general attitude towards them. We didn't let that come through. We just regarded them as friends, I think. To quite a number, Timor might have been Zanzibar. We just didn't know much about these places then. Again, the upbringing hadn't uh, prepared us for what kids get today. They know all about Indonesia and uh, Philippines and Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam. To us, it was the Dutch East Indies, which was one colour, and French Indochina the other, and then the red of Britain was scattered around the rest. As far as knowing about the dangers, we'd probably read in Ryder Haggard novels and so on about malaria and what a dreadful killer it was, but we hadn't really been warned about it, and nor were the precautions there properly. We didn't know what it was. We just felt sick and very weak and. Yeah, the doctor diagnosed it, of course, as malaria, and we just had to rest. There was n had no particular cure or treatment, but uh, after that they started to go down like flies, and at one stage there was probably three quarters of the company laid up at one time. The Japanese outward thrust of December 1941 and January 1942 was one of the most amazing advances in uh, military history. Now, the defence of Australia was based on what was called the Singapore strategy. That meant that once war began with the Japanese, the British would send their main fleet to the Far East to be based at Singapore to defend Australia. But with the fall of Singapore, that was the end of the Singapore strategy, and Australia was now alone. Darwin, 19th of February, 1942. The day the war finally came to the very soil we hold so dear. Australia hears the news of the two massive bombing raids on Darwin with shock and horror. Amid the terrible destruction and loss of life, it is hard for the average Australian to believe that this is anything other than a prelude to a full-scale invasion. Plans are hastily implemented to evacuate women and children from coastal towns. I was in Dilly at the time when those planes went over to bomb Darwin and it just looked like a black cloud. I said to the boys, it looked like we've had this. Odds are four of them and one of us. And that was the... Uh, we thought Australia had gone. So we Hong Kong or Ambon or the objectives もう as there was no effective air surveillance, we had no idea that the Japanese were coming. Uh, in the event of the being a landing, our orders were that we were to hold the aerodrome as long as we could. Uh, and then to withdraw to the hills, but before we left, to fire the pre-set demolition charges. Our job had been done, we'd held them for six hours. I said, uh, then we were going to blow the drum and go, and that's what we did. Uh, we were lucky then to have craters to leapfrog through. Well, there was a bit of confusion, because uh, it meant we just had to get out of Dilly and try and get up into the hills to join up with the rest of the unit. but. Of course, everybody split up into their small groups. Well, we didn't see the unit then for, oh, I'd say, about a month. And that was when we started to, to get soldiers 
selecting criados and criados selecting soldiers. We didn't select our criados, they selected us, I think. They decided they'd like to go with you. They're only kids. They uh, range from, I'd say, anything from nine years old up to about 12. They never questioned the reason that we would want them to come with us, but they just came. They became part of us and the kinship grew as the months went on until uh, even when you were in action, they wouldn't forsake you. They'd be on the outskirts ready to grab a Bren gun, for instance. When we were coming out of action, they'd take it and off and so relieve the load for one person until we picked them up further down the track. The risks they took were, um, I doubt with them, <laughs> even to myself, and there'd be too many to do the same thing. The Japanese swarm into Dili, sweeping the Dutch garrison before them. In the hills above Dili, the heavily outnumbered Australians are forced to take stock of their situation. What's your name, little fella? Fabio. Fabio. One coconut. Come over here and smile at the camera. That's the way. Bernie, what are you doing here? That's told us you were killed. Oh, don't believe everything here, Baldy. Look like you've got everything well under control. Should keep them off our tails for a while. I see you've got rid of your pips too. Yes, they uh, sort of make you stand out a bit. Well, all things being considered, I think we're going to stand out a bit anyway. <laughs> Tell me, have you got any word from our boys on the Dutch end of the island? No. no I'm off to Copang tomorrow if I can get through. If we're going to defend the rear. We need food in Quinoon. See if you can get hold of some money. These rascals love silver. I don't know how long I can keep writing IOUs. In accordance with uh, previous orders, we were falling back the 200 kilometres to uh, join up with the main force in Dutch Timor when we were told by some Catholic missionary priests uh, that it had surrendered after some days of hard fighting. We were then on our own. communications with any Allied command or with Australia and we were completely isolated and we then had to think for ourselves. Despite the best efforts of the signalers, their small radios aren't capable of raising Darwin 500 miles away. As far as Australia is concerned, Sparrow Force has been captured or killed. Families are informed that their sons are listed as missing in action. I don't know where they're coming from, or, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they can't hear me, because I just haven't got enough power. Really? No thanks, I can't keep them down. Hmm. Well, I think you've got to keep trying, so uh, carry on. Yes, sir. What have we got today for lunch, gents? Well, sir, you've got a choice. Roast beef, mum's homemade stew, and to top it all off, plum pudding. I'll go to plum pudding, huh? The movement <laughs> westward into Dutch Timor was reversed, and the three platoons, each of 70 men, was directed back into Portuguese Timor, into three areas in which we hoped to get food, in which we could develop the assistance that we were getting from the Timorese. From these two decisions, uh, to reverse the flow and to spread the platoons out and prepare for offensive action, flowed the whole of the rest of the campaign. Well, it would be really uh, put into us in depth that this sort of thing would occur, that we'd be out on our own, there'd be, uh, we, there'd be no mail, uh, no contact with anybody else, and we'd be living off our own resources, and we'd have to put up with this. And if it occurred, well, it, it, that's all there was about it. Outnumbered and low on supplies, 
the wary Aussies know they can never beat the Japanese on their own terms. The independent company falls back on those tactics that were so basic to their training, hit and run. The conditions may be impossible, the supplies may be barely adequate, but when your company medical officer is Doc Dunkley, these things don't matter. Dunkley is an inspiration to the wounded. As those in his care would agree, there are no decorations high enough for this resourcefulness and courage. There are no awards that match his skill in saving lives. Stop that. Use a hand. Here, a man was trying to do a medical job without supplied. We had no lines of communication and uh, when you realise he was sewing some people up with horse hair and these sort of things, um, I don't know how he did it, I really don't. Feeding them through straws and uh, when their jaws were shot away and these sort of things. He wasn't a, an outstanding Medicare. Doc Dunkley was ably supporting his her heroic endeavours by his four medical corporals and with the invaluable assistance of the Timorese. Between them, they managed to keep us, a lot of us alive and able to keep on fighting. I fell to the ground, bullet wound across the back of the neck, uh, the bayonet through the back, behind the ear, out under the chin. Uh, I laid there for a time, went out, up into, more further into the jungle, and I came up against these natives, waiting, peering at me through the bushes. So I uh, stayed with them while they tidied up the wounds for a while and they took me back further to the village and then Berta Martin uh, took over the job and she cleaned, plugged and tidied up and I was taken back away from the village and I stayed there for some days, a week or more with them but each day I was taken back into the jungle, night time I was brought up and fed and wounds cleaned again. What Berta Martin had done there was no infection. Uh, it was a mixture she used to make up like a clay paste there and she'd plug and uh, I'd go down and stay the day, come back at night, she'd uh, clean up again. She was uh, well, uh, like my own mother. <laughs> I was wounded uh, in the right knee and thigh, fracturing the femur and in the left shoulder. Uh, I was there for a whole day and the natives, uh, Antonio Manair, kept feeding me and giving me drinking water and generally bolstering my courage, although we were under fire most of the time. We knew roughly where he was and the Criados were going to be our, again our eyes. And we got to the village and it was one of the darkest nights I've ever been in. And without the Criados, they just took us by the hands how they found their way, I don't know. It was pitch black. They doused the fire. I, I didn't have a clue what was going on. All of a sudden, I heard some typical Australian profanity. And if it wasn't the doctor and Don Turton, I owe my life to um, the doctor. But uh, more so, I think I owe it to uh, Antonio and Manera in the first place. Was, uh, if they hadn't been able to rig up that first rough old stretcher and get me out, I was gone. As far as the Japanese are concerned, the battle is over. They call on the captured David Ross to contact the remnants of the Australian force. He is required to promise that he will return to their protective internment in Dili. Oh, I've been confined to the house for the whole time. Daily inspections, no decent food. Oh, well, welcome to the Ritz. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to call your room service? <laughs> the Japs didn't just learn to wander off, did they? No. The Japanese consul has asked me to inform you that the Netherlands East Indies military commander has surrendered entirely. Oh, right. The Japanese commander, sure, you must be unaware of this fact. They say unless you surrender now, you'll lose all rights as POWs and be shot on capture as brigands. Oh, surely. The mongrels have to catch us first. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. I'd say there'd be 14 or 15,000 in Kopang plus paratroops and maybe 6,000 in Dili itself. Yes. I don't stand a chance. Do you know that some of our boys were shot unarmed when they were captured on the day of the invasion? No, but it doesn't surprise me. Well, David, 
You tell the Japanese consul that we're a special unit. Yeah, we uh, take our orders directly from uh, Melbourne. And because Melbourne hasn't surrendered yet, as far as we know, we don't intend to surrender either. No way. Uh, no way. Yeah. That'll stir them up a bit. I hope so. And you can tell them we'd rather die fighting them like those other blokes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You tell them. You tell them to stick it up there, Too right, Butch. Is he going to tell them that in Japanese, though? <laughs> <laughs> The story of how the signalers of the independent company built a new radio is one of the epics of the war. Time and again, soldiers went through enemy lines, scrounging for parts. Anything that even looked as if it might fit into a radio was pilfered. It was then up to signaler Joe Lovelace. It was he who believed that the impossible could be done, but could it? Could Lovelace's skill save these lost nomads, or would his efforts end in heartbreaking failure? Try, sir. Well, here's a list of call signs. Truth. They're months old, they've changed them by now. Oh. Let's hope someone in Darwin remembers Sparrow Force. Is that thing going to work? I just build them, Captain Parker. I don't guarantee them. We thought we were gone that with no communications with Australia, we just thought that we were going to stay there forever and ever. <laughs> the morale did uh, uh, sort of jump around a little bit. It depends what we uh, heard through the native and through the grapevine. The lack of mail certainly hurt a lot, and uh, not knowing how they were getting on back in Australia, hearing all the rumours through Portuguese sources and all this sort of thing. I remember seeing once on a tree a crude map showing a bit of the rising sun from Darwin down to Townsville sort of thing and you know for all we knew at that stage and we weren't getting any, we didn't have any wireless to pick up the news that might have happened. With every passing day the ever-present common threat brings the Australians and their native allies closer. As uniforms disintegrate and niceties are abandoned, Rolf Baldwin and Bernie Callanan learn the meaning of another native word, tuaka. Where did this come from? My father's house for you. Why is that? Because by saying you got one, you should have one. Better watch your stuff, Bernie. At least one of us better keep a clear head. Cut a tongue. I've gone into a village where the people in it have been obviously struggling to make ends meet. And I've asked if there were any eggs. And the old man of the village just shaken his head and said, no eggs. And I've said, you know, my men haven't had a feed for two days. And he said, well, we can't have that happen to them. We'll kill a couple of chooks. Kevin Curran had false teeth and he used to twitch his ears and drop his teeth out and they'd run and yell and laugh and then he'd, they'd come from everywhere. There'd be a hundred there just to see him. Come on, Kev, drop your teeth out. And he'd twitch his ears and drop his teeth out. They used to love him, you know, it was magic because they'd never seen it before ever. All along the sort of the, the hundred miles or whatever it was, 100, 150 miles that the company was occupying, we were looking and picking up and sending our patrols to pick up bits of wire and tin and any sort of old bit of um, radio. And of course, some of them may have got spectacular catches going right down into Dutch Timor and raiding into Dili and that sort of thing. And from that, this contraption was made. But our great needs at that stage were, were, was quinine and um, boots, Tommy gun ammunition, and uh, silver money to pay the Timorese who'd been so generous to us without us being able to repay. Sometimes the result of a conflict hinges on a single event. For Joe Lovelace, Jack Sargent and the other signalers, their moment of truth is upon them. Captain Parker knows only too well the stakes are high. We've christened her Winnie the war winner. We're having another go. Might be good luck. Anyway, fingers crossed. Okay, Joe. 
We've been told to stand by. They want to know your wife's name. Joan. Whenever you think of Winnie the War, when do you think of Joe Loveless, the Tasmanian, whose reputation had him a towering Blame figure. Because as far as we were concerned, he he was the fellow that mainly did it. Where's that tobacco you've been hoarding? Celebration, sir. But Joe doesn't smoke. He will tonight. Let's consider for a moment the strategic situation in April 1942. The Japanese had captured Malaya, they'd captured the Dutch East Indies, they'd moved into Australian New Guinea, and in the Philippines the Americans were still holding out, but shortly they'd surrender. MacArthur had taken command in Australia, but he had few troops and material, and he ordered his forces to remain on the defensive. His intelligence told him that the Japanese were going to come through the Coral Sea and were going to attack Port Moresby. And then in the midst of this came the news that the Australians were still holding out in Timor. And this was great for the morale of the Australian government, good for the morale of the Australian military leaders who were feeling just a hint of disapproval from the Americans. And the government was able to use this information to good propaganda effect in reminding the Australian people that they were still taking the fight to the Japanese and very shortly that fight would be carried even further. Radio contact with home is like a lifeline to a drowning man for these homeless troops. The men of Timor know now that their names will be marked off the missing list. They know now that Australia has not fallen and that their comrades at home are still behind them in spirit. From a mum and dad. She's a bit of all right, Pete. Yeah. Lady, help us carry some boxes. Give her four bobs. Keep it moving, come on. And this lady. Another four bob for this lady. How's it going there? Have a go at that, mate. What do you reckon of that? Come on, keep it moving, fellas. What's this? Makulai is a good bull. He saves three of us from walking into a Jap ambush. Treat him well. Jack Kerry. Well done, it's a fellow over here. What do you reckon we pay him, mate? We're going to be worth about ten bob. Right, ten bob for you, sport, now. Yeah. Kick this lazy bugger in the bum and send him on his way. <laughs> <laughs> Give him two, Bob. We were most fortunate in the first place that Sinos, uh, these are Santos, he was the probably two I see of the island. I mean, second behind the, the governor because he was the administrator of the largest province. He initiated uh, a kind of an IOU system which was known as Surats. Everybody was. Uh, allowed to issue these to natives uh, to supply us with anything we required in the way of food stuffs that they had to offer. These were guaranteed to be repaid when we made contact with the Australian government. And these, as far as I know, were fully looked after when they, we got in, in touch with Australia and had the necessary funds to recover the surats and uh, see the natives were paid for what was the thing that kept us alive. Every little inch of ground on Timor was personally owned by somebody and we, we weren't living off the country. We were living off the ground owned by the natives and who supplied the stuff that came from the ground. Porque eu, o pai era uma pessoa que sempre foi pro, uh, foi sempre a favor dos aliados, não é? Mas, me, e, mas à parte disso, por uma questão humanitária, visto que quando os australianos, a primeira de, uh, força que chegou a, a bubonar uh, depois da invasão dos japoneses, uh, não tinham nada, não tinham comida, nem, nem a viagem, nada, visto que eles tinham fugido para as montanhas e, portanto, chegaram até ali sem ter nada. Foi também uma questão humanitária e uma simpatia. Contact with Australia and new radios for the lads on Timor means that the time has come to take the war back to the Japanese. Daring soldiers in OPs or observation posts situated under the very noses of the Japanese, send back vital information to force headquarters and from there on to Darwin. Air support can be summoned to bomb strategic targets with deadly accuracy and Japanese patrols can be reported on to ambush more methodically. Communications have opened up a new phase of organised warfare. Hey, Geordie. How you going? Geordie, mate. How you going? Oh. We're running about an hour, I think, mate. Hey, so I'll help you, mate. 
Soldier friends, come. G'day, mate. How's it going, boys? All right. Bring any food? Uh, we got you a banana or two. Good luck. Like well. How you going, boys? G'day, Doc. Geordie, bad way, eh, mate? How long's it been like that? About two hours. Yeah. You'll be right. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Hey. But a mail came in for you, boys. Yeah, what'd I get? Oh, you got a gas bill. <laughs> <laughs> right. 私はチモールに大体半年ぐらいおりましたけども、その間に、えー、エルメラを中心に四五回あの討伐に出たわけですわ。これで、えー、これをあの徹底的にひらみつぶしにするというようなことではなくてですね。まあ当時で言えば行軍の異部を示すと住民たちにもねというような意味も多分にあったと思うしそれで衝撃を受けましてねで私は聞いたのは、えー、香港作戦までに、えー、連帯がなくなったあ、まあ、兵士がおりますねそれ以上のね、えーまあ、損害がですね、えー、出てですねで、まあ、連帯長から、えーいわゆるああいう大きな作戦にですね、まあ、これだけの戦車が出たとところが今度はこういう,う討伐にですねこんなにたくさんなくなってはいかないとで聞きましたらはっきり私は聞いた話ですが70隊長もですねそういうふうに葬儀を受けてですね、えー、戦死しとるわけですそれで、まあ、中隊長変わるそういうことで、えー、もう何遍も葬儀を受けてですね、えー、まあ,あオーストラリアの兵隊はですね、私はまあ勇敢だと、まあ粘りでいいと、まあそう思いますし。声に出して読みを伝えてください。コノドイ、request you to read the notice out aloud. In the name of the Imperial Japanese Government, we hereby guarantee that all Australian soldiers under your command who surrender to the Japanese force now in Portuguese Timor will receive proper treatment as prisoners of war in accordance with international law. Mr. Consul, I really don't think that the Australian commander will agree to this. And besides, I doubt I could even find him. This time, the Japanese did not insist on uh, Ross giving his word of honour to go back. And in the final talk that the commander had with him, uh, he said that if the Australians did not surrender, he would go out into the mountains and fight it out to the, the finish. Uh, Ross made a shrewd remark that uh, he didn't have enough troops to do it, and to which the commander said, uh, no, but he would get what was required. We were able to uh, evacuate uh, Ross, and uh, so therefore he didn't go back, and we didn't surrender, so the commander drew his own conclusions and prepared for the fight. There was a certain elan in the unit at that stage, as the Japanese said, you alone do not surrender to us. Why don't you surrender? Look, the Dutch commander-in-chief and all the people in Malaya and right down through the Indies Surrendered, you are surely a part of that. Why don't you surrender? But they're always sending us messages about stop your unfreely life and surrender to your friends, the Japanese military. The August push was destined, I'm sure, to push us back into a corner so that ultimately we'd have to either take to the sea or surrender. And they came from all three ways and pushed us back towards the sea. And my first recollection of the, of the push was crawling up a hillside to have a look at the lay of the land and seeing this huge congregation of Japanese up in the Sami saddle. And of course we couldn't pull them on because there was only about 12 of us, so we just stayed and watched the thing and then reported back to headquarters to tell them to move back a bit because, you know, it was going to be imminent.
By August 1942, we'd been fighting for about six months and we were down to an effective strength of about 270. We had an additional 100 that had uh, escaped from Dutch Timor, so we had about 370 spread over about 100 uh, kilometres of mountainous country to deal with uh, attacking columns of Japanese, uh, totalling at least 5,000. Uh, with their greater numbers and their heavier firepower, they were able to keep pushing us back. We were able to delay them and then fall back and hold them up again and again. But uh, after 10 days of continuous fighting, uh, we had almost reached our limits.え、チミドロの戦いを合衆兵と従わけですけどもその熱心さ、その勇敢さにはどこの国にも負けまいと思っておったがま、人を巻くようなそのま、操作とでも言いますか we were exhausted, just about out of ammunition, hungry, or well, we were on a starvation diet because they had very little to eat, a little water, and we were in a bad way. And uh, we've been fighting for you know, quite a long time. And, all the, all the boys were getting a, you know, a little weaker, progressively weaker. And uh, so we're waiting for the inevitable. That night, very lights went up and we thought, hello, this is going to be really it. They'd pushed hard all day and at night we thought, right, not often they put up a night attack, but up went the very lights and everybody just stood firm wherever they were in their sentry go or in the, in the trenches or just lying on the ground. And for some unknown reason next morning, we'd completely lost them. They just weren't there. Uh, I think they'd just run out of the amount of time that they'd allocated for the campaign. If only they'd known that they were so very close to success, but they didn't, and we were lucky. Not only had this gallant band survived their greatest test, but good news was soon to follow. They were thrilled to learn that they would be reinforced by another independent company, the 2nd 4th. An advance party was soon dispatched. Wouldn't worry about that, you'll slap yourself silly. Grenade will take care of them. Water's not going to be a problem? No, no. The biggest drawback's going to be feeding your blokes. We'll split them up and deploy them with our platoons. Right, eh? Oh, I'd get rid of those too before somebody picks you off. You feeling fit? Three-hour march and it's all uphill. This way, Mac. Move out. Right, eh, sir? The mission of the Voyager was to bring the second, fourth company across to be alongside the second, second company, which was identical uh, for a matter of weeks or whatever, and then the second second would be evacuated and the second fourth would take over. We'd got all the troops off and then it dawned on me that the, the ship was aground. The following night, two or three corvettes came in. The, the ship was immovable, so they uh, fired the ship and um, uh, the sailors went off in the corvette. In each area, you had two platoons which really messed up the, the um, food supply. And that, that was a very difficult time when we began to long for evacuation then because we were, we were so stuffed that uh, it was very difficult to move and the malaria still creating ravages in the troops. You know, you'd often have only about 50% of your troops to do anything. Our frontline boys know only too well the value of bullets and guns, but there are other ways to fight a battle. When cameraman Damien Parra arrives, he is determined to show them that war can also be fought with words and pictures. Damien, 
Well, I must say I wasn't in favour of war correspondents arriving. We've got enough trouble up here without civilians wandering around the place. Bernie, me. Bill Marion, ABC. Bill's broadcast heard all over the world. We'll not get in your way. Well, I thought there were three of you. Yeah, there are. Dixon Brown writes for the Ponds and the Yanks. Well, where is he? Bernie, he's uh, finding the going a bit tough. They say he's about 17 stone. I don't believe it. How can they send someone like that? What happens if we have to move in a hurry? <laughs> we stick a pin in him, Bernie. It's going to take him about two days to get him up here. I mean, a pony can't carry him. Well, as you can see, our security is based on everything being kept up here. Major, I'm not in charge of censorship. All I want to do is tell the folks back home you're here. When and what they finally hear, well, that's out of our hands. If I'd have known this is where you operated, I never would have wasted so much bloody film on the way up here. Come on, Bill, have a look around. Keep an eye on Baldy and pass the word round. No risks, no heroics. He gave off an aura of confidence, that man, full of life, and I think that's the main thing I remember about him, was that he was so zestful and wanted to get on with things, you know. I said to him, where's your weapon? You've got to bring a weapon with you, not coming out like that. He said, I've got my weapon. I said, I've got my camera. And that was Damien Tara. He'd be in anything as long as he could take a picture. Well, the strategic importance of Timor is that it was a good base for the Japanese to use to attack Australia. But once the Japanese were put on the defensive, there was little point in the Australians going back to take Timor. But it was of great advantage to us to give the Japanese the idea that we were interested in Timor. Now, the work of the independent companies in 1942 sowed that uh, idea in the Japanese minds, and we continued this idea by putting special forces into Timor for the last years of the war. This meant that the Japanese kept forces in Timor right to the end of the war, and these were forces, of course, that we didn't have to fight in New Guinea. since I'd learnt uh, ten months before that the main force had surrendered, uh, I gave up expectations of getting back to Australia. So I hadn't looked forward to anything at all, but when the time came to part, it was somewhat emotional, and uh, my criado, uh, an elder, he uh, gave me this uh, mug with, and asked me to think of him every time I drank from it. And it's the only thing I did carry off uh, more except the shirt and the pair of shorts that I was wearing. The night that we pushed out was a very emotional affair. Having to leave a boy that had saved you so much. And um, <clears throat> I naturally, like all the rest of us, left everything we had, my saddle, clothes, anything I had at all with him. And he was crying there and the tears pouring down his face but he's playing cards all the time, gambling my things away before I'd even gone. That was probably half a mile. I just shook his hand and, and said, I, we were hoping that we'd be able to bring them with us, but uh, there was, just wasn't enough room on the uh, boat. And uh, so I gave him everything I could possibly give him. I had all the money I had. Uh, uh, I have a sack and a few items that were in there. I gave him everything that I could have, that I had to give, apart from the, uh, uh, you know, the weapon I carried. Felt like giving him that too, actually. Nobody thought they ever would be evacuated. I think we thought we'd been uh, a written off force. But uh, I don't think I was thinking of anybody else much by myself at that stage. But uh, if I was thinking about it, say today, well I know that my thoughts would have gone out to those uh, magnificent uh, Timorese natives that we left behind that have been our lifeblood for the whole of that eight or ten months that we had to handle the uh, Japanese situation. 
everyone would uh, owe their life to the Timorese, there's no doubt about that, and the fact that they're still so involved, even at their late age, and all of them, even now, there's still a very great respect and admiration for them. And so sorry, I think, that they couldn't have done so much more. After leave, the second independent company will reform at Penungra, Queensland, for training. Oh. Training? What for? New Guinea. Oh, Guinea. Right. Carry on. Guinea.